performance. Uh, we risk asymptotically the, the desired performance much more fa much faster compared to training from scratch, and it also works very well for downstream tasks since we mask for downstream tasks at uh, somatic segmentation. Um, so bait version two is only a smarter way to integrate this idea of assigning uh, patches to uh, visual, to, to the, the code book, the visual vocabulary. And the, the mass of encoder is this approach, it's just that this comparison is only for bit base, while the mass of encoder, you can even scale it to you know, bit base, bit large, bit huge. Uh, while I think this model is uh, only bit base and bit uh, l large. So the mass model encoder is much easier to scale in very, very big models, which is a significant advantage if you have a tremendous amount of data available. Okay, this is the. So, so regarding this uh, idea of adapting BERT like training into vision, are there any questions? Okay, that was not too difficult to understand. Uh, so you just have to find a way to, to assign, to discretize, to, to assign like a, a label or a vocabulary entry for all the passes. So this is a core problem you need to solve. So the last uh, part is uh, masked image modeling which is very uh, similar to what we've discussed before. So the next step, uh, so by decoupling this BERT-like training into creating a pre-trained tokenizer or the network that is responsible to assign the visual vocabulary, we now try to integrate this in one step and doing self-supervised learning. Uh, but without relying on a pre-trained tokenizer that will give us the label, the vocabulary entry for this word. Uh, so, so this is the most uh, uh, elegant way to do it. Um, so CLS is the classification head. This is uh, two, uh, identically, two, two identical networks. Here, online refers to an exponential moving average, as always, this self-distillation approach. So it's like a teacher model, but it's uh, an exponential moving average of the student. That's why you see here there are no gradients. Uh, and both models have two heads. One is response. So if, if you remove this head and this head, we, uh, the method is reduced to the dyno approach, what we said. So now we try to So this head and the loss that corresponds to this head, so taking two views uh, of the same image as, the, as you can see with different colors. So we take the classification token and we, uh, we minimize the cross entropy for two different colors that correspond to different, two different views of the same image, that's why you see the cross. So if you remove this and this, it's exactly the approach of Dino. It's just with a different schematic. But additionally, we want to take the same view of the image, uh, one time masked on the path level, on the sequence level of the transformer for the student, and one time unmasked for the teacher. So let's let's just focus on the on the orange. Uh, entities and instead of only optimizing for minimizing the cross entropy for two different views we also want to predict all the token or path based representations that are masked from the student to the teacher so this is just again cross entropy so again you need to have some number of classes so in Dino we saw that they have these 65,000 classes and here they have, again, a similar type of overclustering. So 
as you would expect, again we have cross entropy uh, just between two different entities. So as you can see in the next slide, the, the first objective is what we saw in Dino. So pay attention here that we have U and V. So two different views of the same image. We pass them to different networks and then optimize the cross entropy. So this is just cross entropy, this is the teacher model and this is the student. Uh, but here uh, we have n patches, so the sum is over the different patches, and n corresponds to which patch patches are masked. Uh, so it's like a binary mask. But here we have UI uh, and UI hat. So here we try to match the, 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 the representations, the masked and unmasked representations of the same view. While in the first objective, we try to match uh, different views of the same image. Is that clear? Okay. So this is the whole idea of masked image modeling. Uh, the, the main advantage is that here, the teacher is built dynamically with this exponential moving average. And this allows the, the, the teacher to evolve through training, as we saw. And so now we are no, no longer bounded by the performance of the pre-trained teacher or tokenizer, as we were in the, in the case of this bait approach. Is it clear what, what is the advantage here that the teacher is trained and this vocabulary, this visual vocabulary is learned through training? So the assignment of patches uh, to classes is learned throughout training, is not predetermined as in the first case. Is that clear? Okay. Um, here are some ablation studies. Um, I would say the most important ones are how to balance these two losses. In the end, they use a weight of one, so equal weight. You don't need to come up with strategies to balance those weights. And the second is the number of prototypes. So we saw that during softmas you have some number of classes, and here they use a smaller number of classes compared to Dino in the previous one, was 8,000, but still significantly larger than the number of ground truth classes for even which is 1,000. And, and here they, they search for the, for the masking ratio, so how much of the information you have to mask, and you, you can see again that it's uh, Significant, uh, not significantly, but still between uh, 30 and 40 percent, 20 and 30 percent. So still larger than uh, uh, BERT in natural language. Uh, so just a small recap. So BERT-like approaches in NLP, you have a 15 percent masking. Then uh, the mass total encoder that reconstructs everything uh, on the image space. It's 75% uh, masking. Then bait, which relies on uh, uh, this predefined tokenizer that assigns this code book. Uh, it has 40% masking. And the last approach, which is iPod is the, the abbreviation, but it's basically masked image modeling in vision. But the teacher is now trained with self distillation, and the vocabulary uh, is the number of entries in the vocabulary is predefined to 8,000. Uh, but the assignment to those classes or entries. Is, is, is learned during training uh, is, uh, I think, 30%. So it's still significantly larger than, uh, in, uh, in any case, all the time, have a small, uh, larger percentage. Um, so here I want to make a, a uh, there is a, a small uh, discrepancy 
between linear probing and fine tuning. So I want to ask you if, in case it's not like, uh, if you have uh, a generative task like like mass autoencoder and a discriminative task like uh, Dino. So let's say we have just these two methods. W which one is more likely to work better during linear probing? Yes, the discriminative is just one. Yeah, the discriminative one. Uh, okay, there's no really a real answer, but do you have like any intuition as to why that may happen? Because they use cos entropy. Um, do you explain it? Yes, yes. So they try to assign the views of the images into the same probability distribution of classes, while the mass autoencoder. So, so cross entropy. Uh, again, there is no theoretical justification behind this. This is just some, let's say, speculations. When you use this cross entropy, and you have to decide. Not for exact for one class because it's not one whole distribution, but a distribution among classes. Uh, the amount of information that you need to sustain from the image is significantly smaller compared to reconstructing the whole image, so at least 75% of the image. So when the network is trying to reconstruct the image with an L2 loss, it's really, really likely, even though we have no theoretical work for that, that the, the intermediate features contain much more information and features that are maybe useless inside this representation. And that's why you need to fine tune the encoder or the representations to have a, a very good per downstream performance. While with Dino, uh, it's, 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 uh, it is hypothesized that you, the, the intermediate representations that you learn are uh, less redundant, they're less related, like they're, some information is, needs to be thrown away to learn this representation uh, for the pretext task. And that's why you see significant di difference between plots and papers. So here, is linear probing, and you see that there is no mass autoencoder or uh, bait in this analysis. Uh, and you can even see here uh, the numbers. So table three, table two. So that the the upper table is fine tuning, and you see that uh, these two methods are really similar, or even so everything is in the in the same range of values. But here, when you stay in the linear probing case, fine tuning. Um, so here, when you when you are in the linear probing uh, scenario, you have uh, larger differences between the different models, and th these uh, mass-based approaches uh, are not even in the same. Okay, that's why you don't see this bait or mass encoder in this graph. Is it clear why the, the differences are, why we have much, a much stronger difference when, you, when we do linear probing? And yeah, the last part of the talk, uh, I will try to keep it short, is that how uh, they recently used this uh, eyeball approach as a baseline and did a lot of engineering tricks on top to reach the new state-of-the-art accuracy with a new state-of-the-art method. So I will try to emphasize on the most important parts. Uh, so the first uh, very important uh, optimization or improvement is to replace the centering approach from uh, Dino. We had this centering parameter, which was on the features of the teacher.
So over the, you take the average features over the bus dimension uh, to create the centering parameter, and then you subtract these from all the output features. Uh, and this was a way to avoid this mode collapse as we saw in the previous lecture. And this sync or knob bus normalization, bus normalization it just means that we apply this operation along the bus axis again. So we try to balance the how the samples of the mini bus are distributed. Uh, and they refer to this as a specific uh, case of the optimal transport problem in the in the standard literature of uh, computer science. So they have this iterative method which tries to estimate this Q uh, star and uh, if you want to take a look how this works uh, is uh, in essence we try to we, we, we apply some row and column based normalizations on the bat side on the bat dimension to kind of balance how the features are distributed within a mini bat. So if you want to look at look that up in the literature, and here is some code on Python for that. And interestingly, when uh, the authors of Dino tried this, it didn't show significant uh, improvements. And even though you don't have improvements in terms of performance, you have a more stable behavior that allowed the authors of the next version of Dino to train uh, the network with, with less hyperparameter tuning and larger bus sizes. Um, and the second most important uh, uh, trick is this uh, regularizer. So let, let, let's start from the very beginning because maybe it sounds too complicated. Do, what do we mean when we say regularization in uh, deep neural networks in general? Weight decay. What? Weight decay. Yeah, weight decay is uh, one, technique. one technique. Yes. Do, do you remember how weight decay works? H how it works? Do you remember roughly? Yes? Yeah, so not meaningful, like to not, uh, to not, uh, it doesn't allow the weight to have large values. Do uh, you want to say something? Okay, so regularization is a general, let's say, approach to machine and deep learning. Uh, th th does anybody want to give some explanation on regularization? Yes? It's useful for reducing the model complexity. Yes, so we reduce the space uh, of all possible solutions. So solutions in our case would be all the possible sets of different, hy uh, not hyper parameters. So let's say if we have theta, like uh, 10 million parameters, we have an infinite large, infinitely large space of combinations of these values that they can take. And regularization helps you to, not help, aims at reducing this number of all the possible solutions. So it leads to, it, 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 it allows you to search a smaller space of solutions, very, very roughly. Um, so this, uh, this objective, this regularization, uh, aims to Okay, let, let, let's, let's first discuss uh, a bit about uh, the, the properties of the, of the hypersphere for the feature space. So we discussed a lot uh, the SimCLR objective. And we had uh, two very important uh, properties. So let's imagine, even this is two dimensions, let's imagine the hypersphere again. So everything, all the vectors have like a unit magnitude and they are L2 normalized. Uh, we said that uh, CMCLR, uh, the CMCLR objective is uh, theoretically backed 
and it 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 uh, it has two quite nice properties on the feature space. Do you remember the the, the two properties of how the features will be distributed if you train with SimCLR for images with two different augmentations? Yeah. Ah, this was like a yeah. An explanation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, the whole distribution will be equal, uh, roughly, roughly, asymptotically uh, distributed uniformly in this uh, hypersphere because it's the only way to push everything apart from each other because we only push it together use of the same image. Well, this is. Uh, Let's say class one, class two, class three, class four, class five, and so on. Um, and in the same time, uh, views uh, f one. Okay, no, let's say view one and view two. So the views that correspond to uh, stochastic transformations of the same image will be mapped. Quite sufficiently close on this feature space, uh, at least closer than in the supervised case. That's what they showed with some both experimental and theoretical results that I presented a couple of weeks ago. However, in, during this uh, cross entropy and this uh, pretext task that we saw, so basically cross entropy between uh, different features and self distillation. There is no such analysis that one can perform. We cannot guarantee in advance that we will have this behavior which we would really desire. Uh, and the way to come up with a trick to go closer to this, to, to, to mimic this behavior, one of the ways was this uh, centering operation. Oh, I think I removed it. So the centering was a way to kind of distribute and push everything a bit apart so that we don't collapse by ma like by mapping all the vectors to independent of the image in one uh, class uh, and this sync or knob is another way to distribute at least on the mini buds because we only have one mini bud during its iteration of uh, Training where we perform back propagation. So there's another tip trick to kind of distribute everything so that uh, it, uh, it would lead to maximum entropy. This is an iterative method, uh, and the number of iterations is usually three to between three and ten. So the more iterations you do on this method, you kind of enforce this uniform spreading on the bat dimension. Uh, and this Collier regularizer is a, is a very recent uh, method that um, aims to mimic this kind of properties. So let's see the loss function. Okay, so everything is again L2 normalized, so we have the 
in this case uh, we don't uh, since we, we have this regularization uh, and we want to include as a loss function can you guess if this x i and x j come from the student or the teacher and why? So this is a loss function, so it means that here we want to propagate gradients to help you. So this would be, we need to consider the student outputs here uh, as opposed to the previous scenario of centering and synchronous normalization where we do this in the, on the teacher side where we don't have any gradients. Um, so what do we do here? So let's say we have two different dog breeds, class one and class two, and and during training, uh, these two clusters that let's say they correspond to very semantically similar data for example two dog breeds that on the downstream task we would like to separate them we would like they start to get close to each other so even though we want to maximize between these two views and these two views let's say this is u1 and this is u2 so these two representations tend to let's say collapse they tend to get too close to each other, which may lead to training instabilities, mode collapse, and other different, other uh, undesirable behaviors. So here, let's say, um, this is the number two, number one. To make everything okay. No. So this is number one, this is number one, this is number two, this is U, and this is uh, V. Um, so let's say V1 and U1 are the representations from the student, and V2 and U2 are the representations from the, from the teacher. Um, I did this on purpose, so that these, these look closer. So we're trying to push, even though, um, yeah, actually, Let's simplify different student views inside the minibus, so one that corresponds to the student, we try to find this, this mean uh, operation just tries to find what is the closest vector to, one, to the reference one. So let's say we take as reference xi and we see that u, uh, v1 is the closest to u1 and we only push away not all the different pairs but we push away on the feature space only the one that are the closest so we would only push away uh, v1 from u1 how do we do that? Um, so in cross entropy we have y Say target log prediction. So, what is outside the log? Uh, the prediction tries to mimic what is outside the log. So, in this case, this 1 divided by n is a vector of a uniform distribution. So, this this distance between the closest pairs on the feature space 
tries to follow the uniform distribution. So this is what I mean by pushing away only the closest pairs on the feature space. Is that clear? Okay, so this is a smart trick and if you don't uh, have this mean, uh, probably you push everything away from each other so the, the, the we will have this type of collapse where we have a, a sort of uniform distribution with maximum entropy and the model cannot decide which class to assign uh, for its uh, example. So it's very crucial to only push push away the ones that are, tend to go closer to each other. Is that, is that clear? That without this mean, this operation would not work? Okay, this is one of the most important and as you will see there are other tricks but they are more uh, engineering tricks so I will just skip them for now. Um, so this Dino P2 started from the previous baseline that we saw and incrementally uh, on a large, with a large model and a large data so they incrementally added different ways either to make everything more stable or to increase the performance and if you see this this regularization on the feature space was one of the most critical at least in terms of uh, KNN accuracy so KNN it means that on the downstream task I see the I take into account the K let's say 20 nearest neighbors and I do majority voting and take their label as the, as the label of the test data based on the 20 closest training data. And you can see apart from all the engineering tricks this is the core objective, the core trick or regularization or loss function that uh, had the largest impact on the nearest neighbors and this simple knob normalization which is uh, a combined uh, a combined technique along with scaling up the bat size. So these two, you can perceive them uh, like as a pair. So by increasing the bat size and using this synchronop, uh, let's say normalization in the bat uh, axis, you you make everything much much more stable. That would be that would you other you would otherwise need different tricks to make this work. Uh, the other are just engineering tricks and hyperparameter searches. Robustness, what do we have here? Yeah, we will cover this in the next lecture. I don't want to push you so much. I will just uh, let you see a couple of uh, image samples uh, that we would uh, use as uh, data sets to not only rely on the validation accuracy of ImageNet, but see how the model and the layer representations perform into more challenging scenarios. Um, so we'll only take a very quick look on the images. So this ImageNet A, uh, stands, a stands for adversarial, uh, refers to a set of images that neural networks have a very hard time recognizing the real objects and they tend to confuse the, the object, the, the class, with, uh, with something else. So the red one, as far as I remember, is the, the prediction, which is always wrong. Uh, so for some reason we don't quite understand I think this is results are from CNNs, but digital transformers are equally susceptible or more or less in the same scale susceptible to recognizing, to not, reco to not distinguish, to not uh, classify these images correctly. And on the black, like fox squirrel is the real class. So these are some typical examples. And this image and O refers to, as we call them, out of distribution samples. So samples that are really different uh, semantically and statistically or either one of them. 
and this is an example of a photosphere, uh, which is something that the network has not seen during pre-training on Imaset. While uh, and it tends to be full to it, it, the bottle is getting full and it directly classifies with a very high confidence this as a jellyfish. So the, this, these images are what we call natural adversarial examples, so very difficult examples to classify with a neural network. Uh, images of R are different uh, renderings, uh, so we use some style transfer techniques. This um, text here uh, indicates the type of rendering that you apply to the initial image so that you distort the style. You, tr you, you, you still keep the initial image. Uh, for example, this would be a SAR, but you try to apply a different type of rendering and you want to see how, this, how the network, uh, if the network can still be invariant to different rendering types. Uh, the last one, yeah, these are algorith algorithmically generated corrupted images and uh, the text indicates the different uh, transformations that you can apply with an image with a very high brightness, an image with a very low contrast, uh, blur, different types of blur, Gaussian noise. So this is a, another subset or ImageNet C. This is C refers to these kind of uh, corruptions or perturbations. And the last one is uh, sketches uh, drawn from uh, humans, as far as I remember, uh, with classes that correspond to ImageNet, but like sketches, so a really abstract thing. And in this, in the next one or two lectures, we'll try to see not just how we perform on ImageNet, validation set for vision, but also these, uh, as we call them, robustness studies. So how robust are the different <coughs> representations if we perturb either naturally or adversarially these inputs of the, of the networks. Um, so as I remember, yeah, that's it for today. I hope we are on time. Thank you.